Pixel 6. Hello and welcome. My name is Gianni and welcome to Pixel Sift. This is episode 162 and on Pixel Sift, we talk to developers from all around the world about what it actually takes to make games. Now, if you picked up an Apple device, especially in the early days of the iPhone, good chance that you might have played one of the Altos titled. They were groundbreaking, award-winning games that really captured the touch interface uh, and have continued on to be one of the most popular mobile games for the platform for many, many years. Now, they're made by the creative and development team who, who now helm Land and Sea Games. That's Harry Nesbitt and Jer McBain. And I spoke to them a little while ago about the lessons they'd learnt over the years of making the Alto Collection uh, and what their new endeavour will hold. Let's jump in. Hey there, if you're enjoying the show and you want to hear more, subscribe to Pixel Sift on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, or listen on pixelsift.com.au. See you there. So let's start with the game that's just come out. That's the Alto Collection. Uh, it's a game that a lot of people may not know you individually from, but they almost certainly would have played your games. Uh, it's a re-release of a game that came out quite a while ago, 2015, for the original uh, game in, on iOS. And then in 2018, uh, you've brought out a sequel as well to that. And, and now it's out on, on the new consoles. Can you tell us a little bit about that process of bringing that game up to modern console standard? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. It's it's quite surreal as well. I think when we first started uh, working on these projects, I don't think we ever would have had the idea that they would eventually, you know, come to console in that way. Um, it sort of, in a strange way, feels like a kind of ultimate legitimization of, of these games. Like they, I've just, you know, I grew up with consoles. I grew up playing games on PC. I only came to mobile games much later, and and sort of, uh, even though I think they are, it's a, in a fantastic platform. It's a very accessible platform, and it allows people to make a new kind of game. There's something still inherently kind of, I think, just uh, sort of, yeah, much more magical and kind of grounded about the idea of having a game on a console and to be able to see it everywhere. Like we're 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 on all all available platforms. Um, and with with Switch this week, it's um, especially Switch. I think is I think a lot of people have a very um, you know sort of fond relationship with that platform. It's it's kind of the perfect hybrid almost of mobile and console gaming, um, and it's just a beautiful piece of hardware. So it's it's great to see our games on there as well. Um, so yeah, from from that perspective, it's it's just yeah, it's very humbling and very uh, yeah, very exciting. <laughs> Does that feel good at the end of a particular chapter of your career? Because now you're moving into a new studio and I know studio team Alto was not really even really sort of a studio. It sort of just happened uh, that way, but does it feel nice to kind of capped Alto off and uh, moving on to something new? I mean, the, the Alto franchise is still sort of very much alive and we're continuing to, to sort of think about that and shepherd it into the future. And um, we're certainly not, ready to put it behind us but i think you're right in the sense that this is a nice kind of chapter marker to to sort of say almost kind of tie up what we've already achieved and kind of bring that to a new audience this is the kind that especially proves that mobile guy, games, games stand on their own or, or other um, and yeah it's it's a sort of as i say it sort of feels like it legitimizes those games for a wider audience and it um, yeah, I think it, it sort of helps us sort of set our sights to the future and, and kind of what kind of games we we really want to be working on next. So, uh, yeah, I think in that way, very much so. I'm really keen to hear some of your thoughts on how the industry has changed in the time since uh, the first Alto came out. Mobile games were in their infancy at that stage, and I remember the series being as one that if you had an iPhone – Everyone was like, you've got to play Alto's Adventure. Uh, you've got to play Alto's Odyssey. That was the the game that everyone suggested you play. Yeah, I mean, it's changed massively. And I think 
I don't think we realized at the time that we were kind of on the cusp of this, this sort of shift in perception. Um, we, we sort of felt like we were almost coming at the end of something. There was this, obviously this, this big surge of, of developers moving to mobile. It was a kind of a gold rush and we kind of came towards what felt like the end of a bit of a, a sort of a period of time where um, there was a lot of free to play mechanics finding their way into games. People were sort of beginning to, I, grow, I guess, grow a little bit wary of that. They, they sort of understood um, how those kind of games worked and their psychology. And I think there was definitely a sort of a desire for something more artistic and something more pared down, a little bit more respectful of players' times in a way that people were perhaps more used to on other platforms. Um, and it, we certainly weren't the first. There was many games that inspired us to sort of take that, the confidence to sort of make something that was a little bit more understated and didn't really rely so much on all the same kind of trappings and and gimmicks as... as um, perhaps more of those free to play games, but we still are very much inspired by those games. We want something that's very easy to pick up and is accessible. It has a really engaging core loop. Um, so it was kind of a mix of those ideas. I think when we're talking about things that have changed, uh, I think back then, 2015, for example, with Aldo's Adventure, it was, it was maybe harder to actually get in and, and make games, but it was much easier to reach the people who could help you then sell those games or help you then bring those games to other people, or even just by virtue of having it on a platform um, like like the App Store. It was just going to reach more people because there's less competition. And if we're talking about things that are, are difficult now, for people who are coming in the door, it's just getting that first foot in and, and meeting the person that can help you bring your, your game to a platform. So I think in terms of coming in at the right time and finding that luck, you know, Harry had done all this great work and, and built this beautiful experience. And then the timing was right to, to reach people. Maybe were we doing that now, you know, we wouldn't reach quite as many people. I still think the product would stand alone and be very strong, but making a good game isn't all there is to it these days. So I think that in particular is one of the biggest things that's changed, but that said, it is also easier to get in and make a game now. So, in, you know, those things don't necessarily even out, but um, yeah, th they're the changes that I see for sure. What are the lessons learnt during that time that have really shaped what your current games uh, and how, how they're being made now? For Alta's Adventure, it was a two-year development cycle, um, but that's taking into account that it's a very small team. Um, it was my first experience um, working in games, um, so there was a lot of things to, to work out, but also just not feeling like there was this real urgent kind of critical window which we had to sort of work within just allowed the game to breathe and mature naturally and a lot of the best ideas that made its way into the game which i don't think it would have been quite the same without sort of came much later in that process when you've kind of grown with the project and you're looking at it with fresh eyes over time um, and sort of, yeah, allowing yourself the freedom and the flexibility. If you've, you know, if something interesting comes to you, you've got the time to sort of experiment with it. Even if it's not necessarily critical to that kind of core design, it, it sort of adds a little bit of extra depth and value and, and sort of, I guess, magic to, to the experience that ultimately the players will notice, even if it's not sort of hugely uh, sort of front of mind consciously sort of aware of these things it would just all together build towards the overall experience so that's again something that we recognize is a very privileged place to be that we can take our time with things and while it may not always be possible in the exact same way i don't think we ever want to return to sort of working in in that sort of the, the, the way we did very early on i don't think it was sustainable or, or necessarily entirely healthy um, there is a grain of that sort of flexibility that we want to keep and sort of allowing, I guess, following this sort of path of least resistance with the project. If, if your curiosity and your, uh, your sort of, um, energy is pu pulling you in one direction to sort of play with the system or, or, or trying add add some sort of, uh, feature or, or kind of little, little, uh, sort of experiment, then it, it, I think to follow those instincts and allow the time to kind of work on those things could is always going to benefit the project and, and 
player and sort of delight the players at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm curious, as a producer, if you've got a team that can follow threads down different paths and sort of take as much time as they need to do things, how do you actually produce that game? How do you produce a product in a way that makes sure that everyone can do the things in the creative way they need to, but also so you can finish something? I think it's just about setting clear objectives, and that's a very cliche thing to say, but it is true in that you know, we, we might acknowledge that we need to make things three or four times. Maybe it's a particular system or a piece of art, and we need to see it in context to, to really understand, like, does it fit there? Does it does it bring the feeling we want to, to bring to the player by virtue of it being there in the way it currently is, or do we need to make it again? Um, particularly with systems, I think it's all well and good to kind of design it on paper, but until you can kind of feel that thing, um, you kind of you can't really say exactly how long things are going to take. So for me, I think it's about kind of designing up front, having an agreed upon idea of what the thing is going to look like, getting getting down to work and trying to build it together and, and establishing a timeline for like when you say that first version is going to be evaluated, say, rather, let's not say done, but say it's evaluated. Um, and then if we agree that needs more work as a team, um, pulling perspectives from from all the people who have, you know, very different experience on the team, um, we can then say, all right, our second pass at it's going to look like this and our objectives for getting to, to the next point where we evaluate it again or either sign off on it is here. And it's kind of that iterative process. So you kind of just need to acknowledge that you have to build things first um, and you need to be aware that you don't have forever and you do have budgets to work with and ultimately they're going to dictate how long you have. Um, but in, in our case, it's about finding partners to work with that have – the understanding that we, you know, we have a process, we need to go through it, and we're going to keep lean and, and small um, to try and, I guess, stretch that process as far as it can go for, for the least <laughs> for the least amount of money we possibly can with experienced people who kind of, by virtue of their experience, have have been through these things before, uh, and can help us answer questions that maybe a less experienced team couldn't answer. It's just about reducing risk, really. Can you tell me a little bit about how the team kind of came together, how it's sort of structured? Because it sounds like it's not like some of the other formal studio structures that people may be familiar with? Something that we talked about a lot is that every role in a game team is a creative role in some regard. And and we kind of want to encourage that in every person that we bring in, whether they're a programmer who you know might traditionally be more on the implementation and system building side, um, or whether they're an artist who's traditionally seen as a creative. We want everyone to have a voice in that process and feel they have room to explore, I guess, their, their creative interests. So, for example, when I say a, a programmer is a creative role, well, ultimately, they're often the last kind of pair of hands on a particular piece of art, a particular system, and those things come together to form the whole player experience. Um, and, and I think that in that respect, you know, we should really consider that they do have an immense influence over how that experience plays out and, and therefore are creative people. Um, and I think in terms of kind of defining like how people can contribute creatively, we're not really interested in drawing particular boundaries by role. It, it's just a case of making sure everyone can come in and contribute in the way that makes sense to them while, of course, still trying to hit their core responsibilities. Jay, can you tell me, I, the new games that are going to be coming out soon, I know you're working on a project at the moment at the moment's described as folksy sort of games in an interview that I read today. Um, tell me a little bit about what the future holds for Land and Sea and what sort of games that you're going to make. If you look at the Alto games, you'll see this, this kind of folky elements, a kind of acknowledgement of a real place that it, whether it's actually a real place or not it's it's a real place we almost treat it as a real place where there's things happening off the screen there's there's cultural influences there's historical influences and that kind of comes together to form this this feeling of a space that is perhaps a little richer than it might otherwise be despite there not being much in terms of story or um, any exploration of those things beyond the, the borders of the screen there's a sense that it's there so what we're looking to do is to continue that forward but also introduce these elements of of storytelling of i guess sharing of messages whether that's directly or whether that's kind of something you pick up on through your play experience and also i think delving into systems a little further than we've been able to with with the Elder games so um looking at different genres, um, challenging ourselves to experiment with uh, systems that maybe require a little more from the player, uh, but at the same time still ensuring we keep a kind of 
digital space for someone to go to and and uh, almost escape that that escape element of the alto games is something we also want to carry forward i think harry's heard for years now that these games the alto games in particular have allowed people to kind of step away from their real life and whether that's um, to, to relax or to do with with pain or to um just be away from from the everyday hustle and bustle i think that is also something we want to carry forward uh and to talk about evolution again i think the other games maybe didn't get to touch on as many uh i, I guess deeper more human subject matter um that we would like to in the, in the next in the next few games as well. So I think in a way it's almost like a maturing of of the idea of what the Alto games are and, and what they can achieve. Um, Harry, maybe you can speak to the, a little more because it's been something that's been stewing for you for a while. But I guess to, to speak to like why I've come on and, and joined Harry, it's it's that these are the types of games I've been thinking about for a long time and was hugely inspired by the Alto games initially to kind of explore in the space of games. You know, I love telling stories. I love creating experiences for people that, that kind of take them out of, of what's going on day to day for them, because that's really, that's the power of, of games that appeals to me. Yeah, no, I, I think you, you put it really nicely. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely very much about that creating a sense of a, of a, a internally consistent sort of world that the games take place in. Even if it's not realized in full detail, there is very much a sense that it's, it's, bigger than what you see and there's something beyond the edges of the screen that uh, that kind of maybe sparks your curiosity or imagination even if you're not fully aware of it consciously um i think that's something that really stands out in games or i mean any medium really that has really stuck with me um is the sense that it's it there's more more to discover or more to imagine within that world um and that was very much at the core of, of the Alto games was, was trying to infuse it with as much sort of, I guess, implied narrative, um, even if we don't go into detail about who these characters are and the world they inhabit. We've definitely thought about it quite deeply and we've um, we've got good ideas about what this world is like, what the rules are like. It, it's not just a game world for the sake of the game necessarily. It's almost incidental to the fact that a game is taking place in it. Um, and that hopefully resonates with people. Um, so it's, and it, and it also encourages, I think people to engage with, with that work and want to add to it. Like we get incredible fan art and even fan stories and people come up with their own ideas for, 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 um, you know, potential future games. And like, I think it shows that there's a sort of a rich sort of foundation there that appeals to people enough to get sort of spark their curiosity. And they feel like it's, I don't know, they have, a, I guess, a personal connection with that. It feels like a place that they, they have visited and people that they've actually spent time with. Um, and it's sort of hopefully sticks with them long after they've put the game down. Um, and yeah, we very, very much want to continue that thread uh, it, it even in like sort of dive a bit deeper into that and make, put that a bit more at the forefront of what we're making. When we talk about folk, it implies a kind of small smallness, I guess, a kind of human element that you don't get in, in gra um, grander stories. Like if we, if we talk about um, mythology, so, you know, ones that come to mind are like, you know, the Greek gods, but how do you see yourself in that? space it's it's very hard to do that for a normal person right so i think the things we want to pull in and and the influences we want to pull from are like folk art um, folk tales things that are particularly passed down in regional areas through um verbal storytelling um and given that the studio is based in the uk and particularly in the in the south of the uk there's a kind of rich uh, body of, of of history and folklore and, and storytelling to pull to pull from and influence I guess the the human elements of the game and and the ways that the environment and and people interact and the way that these maybe it's it's, it's mythical creatures maybe it's um, mythical places or, or real places with a kind of story that's that's stuck to them I think pulling from from those elements is is what informs 
that that folk angle that we're trying to apply to games. And it's not something that I think has been narrowed down on so so much previously. There's definitely games that have these elements. Yeah, Harry mentioned Monument Valley previously. I think that almost has a a, a smallness, a closeness to it, uh, and it, it feels folky by nature. Um, one that I know Harry is very influenced by is um, Ico and and maybe even Shadow of the Colossus. Those games have a very rich kind of folk influence in them. And Harry, maybe you can speak to those a little bit as well. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's about telling ultimately human stories, as you say, um, something that can be very broadly relatable no matter where you're from or, or your background is. There's something, I think, in the stories that we pass down that survive sort of the test of time that are just inherently relatable and and even even in our kind of modern lives. And I think it's it's usually, I guess, I think in games, sort of like almost ironically, it's the games that don't rely on dialogue that have that quality almost. They're, they're better able to communicate a sense of place and a feeling and a sort of a quiet revelation to the player that uh, other kind of more traditionally narrative-based games maybe wouldn't be able to do. I think Eco is, is definitely a top, top example you mentioned right at the top that you want to take the time to make the game, to explore different avenues of creativity as you go. When can we expect to see some of the, I guess, fruits of your work uh, in the future? There's there's a number of things going on for us as a studio. Uh, as Harry said, the, the Alto universe is something that's important to us and we don't want to completely put that behind us. It's something we think about, something that influences who we are and we want to keep looking to that for inspiration as we go forward. Um, similarly, we, we shared a teaser of, of a project we've we've been working on for what well, Harry and, and particularly Joe um, had been working on that for about two years uh, in terms of like exploring that creatively, figuring out what it is, figuring out how the identi- identity of the studio and that game mesh together. Uh, and and now we're kind of at a point where we're thinking about what would we really like to do with this game, and and how do we bring it together? Um, and, and define what it is, and, and move forward, and start thinking about, you know, wh- how do we how do we put this out, and and when is the right time, and, and what does it look like, and who do we need to help do that? So, um, right now, our focus is is bringing people in to help us put this thing together, um, and, and and figure out what it is as a group. Because while Harry and Joe worked on that for quite some time, I think the second we introduce new people into the mix, even myself, you're going to have new influences that we'll want to give space. Uh, we, we want to give space to those people to let their their voice and their influence impact what the work is. So we, we don't really have a plan for exactly when it's going to happen. Unfortunately, we can't kind of commit to any dates or times, but I think um, we definitely feel there's there's a desire to, to share the things we're making and to kind of put this this folk and, and this minimalism and, and all these subjects we're talking about into something we can show and, and validate these thoughts that we've been having because of the fact that I think that we've we've been sitting on a lot of ideas and thinking about them sort of quietly behind the scenes for quite a while now, even before um, Alto's Odyssey, a lot of these things were sort of started to churn and set in motion. Now that we've publicly announced the, the studio and the team and we, we're talking about who we are, I think there's, a, there's a, a real desire to keep a sense of momentum and continue talking publicly about what we're doing even if we're not ready to reveal the full extent of it i think there's going to be a lot of ways that we can really engage in that conversation and sort of talk about our process and and who we are um kind of more on a more frequent basis and so we're yeah hoping that next year will you know 2021 um we'll be able to talk much more kind of frequently about what we're doing and, and just be a bit more kind of present and active in, in, in the kind of the game scene. Uh, if, you know, and hopefully also get out there into the world if, if that's allowed. <laughs> um, and yeah, meet with people and talk about who we are. And yeah. We, um, I think you, before you were talking about the challenge of, of blending minimalism and, and wanting to do more, I think in some ways it's a similar challenge. And, and I think the reason why, it's good that Harry has the kind of background and sensibilities he does. And, and then I bring with me a set of, of slightly different sensibilities is that like he, Harry will be pushing for, for quality and, and um, I guess uh, 
creativity and, and um, I guess that time, like you said, and and my background is coming from more of the all right, let's get a product out the door and let's build something we can give to people. And I think that kind of meshing of of our anxieties, our uh, experiences, all of the things that feed into who we are is going to put us in a place to to bring more people into that mix and and start getting the pace moving along and and kind of see see the fruits of what we've been thinking about and building towards come come to fruition for sure. Yeah, well, I think I think the fact though that you've even heard of the studio and we've pu- managed to publicly announce is testament to how Jair is able to push things forward. Because I think I would have just deliberated on that forever. <laughs> we always like to ask developers who've been in the game for a while. Uh, you've been doing it for well, almost seven years, close to that, and that makes you almost a veteran within the ranks of developers. Unfortunately, this industry because it's something that people don't tend to hang around in for a really long time. Um, but what is one piece of advice you'd like to give to someone starting out that you wish you knew uh, that someone told you uh, when you first started? Something that Harry and I have both been through and we've spoken about a few times at length is uh, t- to make impactful games, to make high quality games. I think first and foremost, you need to look after yourself. Um, and you, you, know, you, you ask anyone who's worked in games professionally for more than a year or two, they've probably experienced some level of burnout. Um, and it speaks to kind of the pressures that we put on ourselves and are put on us as an industry to to constantly be showing the work that we're doing to to perform to um, be active in the community beyond just sitting down and working on a game which can often take years to, to get to the point where you're ready to show anything um, it just it just adds a lot of pressure and it can encourage you to kind of put other things in your in your life aside whether that's just you know creative inspirations coming from engaging with books or film, um, whether that's your health in terms of exercising or eating well, or even just the relationships you maintain. I think first and foremost, you need to make sure that you, you preserve those core foundational things that, that make for a, a happy and healthy life. And, and then your games will be better as, as a result. You, you may feel like you've got the energy to give to things um, above and beyond what may be expected or what's normal, but... Uh, yeah, be aware that that's, I think it's kind of a debt that you're, that needs to be paid back at some point. Um, and it, it can really sneak up on you, that burnout feeling. Um, it certainly did for me. Like it was, I think if I had said, told you at the time, if you'd asked me back then, I would have probably wouldn't have noticed that I was burning out. I would have been like excited and happy to put in everything I could. And I, and I think to some extent it's hard to really you know, blame anyone for wanting to do that. Um, if you're passionate about what you're making, if you're excited about it, if you've got a lot to prove, as I felt I did, like this was my first time making a game and I'd never made one before. And I really wanted to prove to myself and I guess to others that this was something I could do. I was going to do whatever I could to make sure that it was the best it could be. And ultimately feeling proud of your work is, is a really good thing to strive for. I think it's not something everyone can strive for. It's not something everyone has the opportunity to do. So it's, again, it's you know, something to recognize. But, um, yeah, that that can't be sustained. And I think especially if, you're, if your game then – I mean, this is the thing. I think a lot of developers will put everything on the line to hit, hit that launch day, and they put, put so much – weight on that moment of shipping their game they tend to i guess lose sight of the fact that the day-to-day before and after that's you know that's your life that's that's your your that's when you are growing as a person and you're and you're setting the the habits that are going to inform kind of you know how you continue in in this in this industry as as a professional for the into the future i don't think games are necessarily that special as a medium certainly they offer things that other mediums don't like harry said you can kind of go into them and and take part in them and you're an actor in that space you can't have that in anything else indeed but what i mean is um i think there's a lot of things games haven't learned from traditional mediums like film like books um like just live music, for example, or or just the art of of playing music. I think if you got into making games because you've engaged with games a lot and that's the thing that you do with your life, 
then the games you make will be referencing other games. And if we keep doing that, we're going to get to the point where we've just got this big uh, circle of, of self, like self-referential things in our lives and, and we kind of lose sight of the human experiences and, and maybe some of the other things that are magical about actually living in the world. So I just encourage people to go out and do things that aren't games and experience things that aren't games and bring that back into games. Uh, I think we'll have much more diverse and interesting experiences and we will have more people who aren't gamers getting into the space and engaging with it. And I think that's really important if we want to grow and expand our craft uh, and the things we make and, and I guess add more value to the world. Thank you very much. Well, that's probably going to be the pull quote for the episode, I reckon. Uh, thank you so much both for sharing your time with me, being so candid about the process of what it's taken to get to this point and telling us a little bit about what the future holds. I appreciate you both coming on the show. No problem. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I'd love to speak to you. So that's Harry Nesbitt and Jer McBain from Land and Sea Games. They're part of the creative and development team behind the Altos Odyssey and Altos Adventure game, now collected as part of the Altos Collection. Um, and you can pick that up on a number of different console releases as well. Still also available on Apple devices, on iOS, uh, as the original platform that it came out on, but now on many, many more. Check out what they've got coming up uh, by giving them a follow on Land and Sea Games uh, on Twitter. Give it a search for that one. You should be able to find them uh, or give Harry and Jer a follow themselves. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Now, can I ask you a favor while you're there? Can you uh, get your friends? Uh, and subscribe them to Pixel Sift. Uh, get them into their podcast app. Show them what we do. Tell them if you think we're cool. Um, and let them check out some of the great development stories that we have covered over the over many years now. Uh, we'd love for you to share this with your friends and family, anyone who you think might enjoy the show. And if you're online, go to the Pixel Sift Discord. That's pixelsift.com.au forward slash Discord, uh, where you can join a community where people share their work, they talk about games, um, and it's just generally supportive and really, really nice. So if you're interested in joining a good, wholesome community, head to pixelsift.com.au forward slash Discord. While you're on the web, uh, head to our website. That's pixelsift.com.au, where you'll find articles, you'll find videos, you'll find other podcasts, including our other podcasts called Mainstream, and much, much more. That's pixelsift.com.au. For that is all the time we have for now. Until next time, have fun. <laughs>